Okay, welcome back to the last session of uh, EPIC Workshop. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce David Crandall, which is Professor of Computer Science at Indiana University. And he's also one of the historical organizers of uh, EPIC Workshop from uh, the beginning, uh, second edition, I think. Uh, he's the Director of uh, Graduate Studies and Director of, of uh, the Center for Machine Learning in Indiana, and uh, he has received the career award from the National Science Foundation. And David is going to give a talk on egocentric vision to study children uh, development. Thank you, David. Um, sure, thanks so much, Giovanni, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so like Giovanni said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about an interdisciplinary project that sort of combines computer vision, egocentric computer vision, and studies of child development in, in developmental psychology. And before going further, I should, I want to acknowledge that there is a big cast of characters that supported the work I'm going to talk about today. So Professor Chen Yu and Professor Linda Smith uh, are developmental psychologists, and they really provided that expertise. And then the, the students in, in postdocs in my lab, of course, provided the computer vision expertise. And then you can see a lot of their pictures here. And I'll try to highlight as I go along um, sort of uh, the whose who's study or whose work was who's whose. Um, but to sort of set this up, um, this is a picture that I like a lot. Um, you know, all of us here are interested in egocentric computer vision. Well, this is a picture from an article back in 1945 uh, by Vannevar Bush who wrote this article in The Atlantic where he foretold a lot of the technologies that we have today, or at least if you if you look at it in the right light, he did. So for example, he famously foresaw the internet in a form of, a, of something he called the Memex device. But in his paper, he has this picture of a scientist wearing a camera in the lab, and the, his, he was thinking to a future where scientists would no longer have to like write in lab notebooks. Instead, the results of their experiments and everything that they saw would actually be recorded you know, automatically. So they wouldn't need that. By the way, I love the, the wire here. I think he didn't foresee wireless cameras. Um, but anyway, this idea of like egocentric computer vision for science is something that I think is really compelling. And um, we are not doing it in this way. So we're not using it to record our observations. Instead, as Satoshi alluded to a couple of minutes ago in his talk, we've been using um, cam wearable cameras and gaze trackers uh, attached to kids and parents to understand how, try to understand how kids um, learn to see the world, learn to recognize objects in the world. And over the last like 15 years, uh, Professor Chen Yu and Linda Smith in psychology have developed this paradigm for collecting egocentric data from children. And in, in that talk a couple of minutes ago, someone asked uh, how this is possible. And the answer is that it's quite difficult. Um, uh, there's a, a process, there's been many iterations of getting the cameras right, of getting everything working for an infant-sized person. Um, also, for uh, there's a there's a procedure they have to follow for acclimating the child to the camera so they don't just rip it off and things like that. So it's really been um, quite, there's quite a bit of expertise that goes into being able to do this. Um, but anyway, once you have the cameras mounted on kids and parents, then the kind of data that you can collect is very rich. So for example, here is a parent and a child playing in the lab with some toys and you can see synchronized on the left, the child's first person view with eye gaze tracking and on the right, the parent's first person view with eye gaze tracking. And so you get very sort of fine grained moment by moment information about what everyone was attending to, what they were looking at. There's other sensor data that can be collected as well. And so why is this important? Well, the developmental psychologists are trying to understand how kids you know, learn the names for new objects, for example. And you can think uh, as a parent, there could be a variety of different ways that you could try to teach the name of an object to a child. And they all are subtly different and some may be more successful than others. So for example, if I wanna teach you the name of this object, I might sort of hold it up and wait for you to look at it and then to say the name of the object. Or I might look at the object and say the name of it. Or I might wait for a moment of joint attention where we're both looking at that object and then say the name of it. Well, you know, different of these may have different outcomes. And so to understand how, to, how kids learn and how to improve learning, we can collect this fine-grained data to do it. As a specific problem, um, kids have to solve the problem of referential uncertainty. So let me set this up to you. Uh, let me set you up for this. Pretend that you are the infant observer in this uh, picture. So imagine that you are, this is your field of view, and you are gazing right there. Um, 
And your mother, who's sitting across the, the table there, says, Pegbo. And you're like, okay, great. Well, I know that this is a word I guess I'm supposed to learn, but what is she referring to? Because I'm right now looking at there, is that the Pegbo? Or is it the object that I have in my hand? Or is it the object that she has in her hand? Or is it the object that's largest in my field of view? Or is it the one that's moving, whatever? And are we even talking about the name of an object or is this an adjective, is it a color, is it a verb? You know, what is this? Well, this is a fundamental problem that children have to solve. This problem of referential uncertainty, it's very similar to weak supervision problems that we have in computer vision. Um, now, so this is the kind of problem that, that, that these folks are trying to understand, uh, trying to solve. Now, over time, um, there, you, you might have noticed there that the, the lab environment there was draped in all white. That was to make uh, computer vision algorithms from 10 to 15 years ago uh, work because in order to detect these objects automatically. Now, over time, the camera technology has gotten better and lighter and better uh, battery life and so on. And uh, the computer vision techniques have, uh, of course, gotten better. And so they've been able to take this kind of uh, data collection paradigm into more realistic environments, including this is a, a home simulation in a lab, but also into homes themselves and collect much more realistic training data. Now, this is much less, much more realistic data to analyze. Now, this has created really interesting technical challenges for our lab to solve. And so in the first sort of part of this talk for the next few slides, I'll just show you a few of the uh, sort of technical kinds of challenges that we worked on that really arose from, as it, from, from this, um, child, these child studies, helping the uh, developmental psychologists analyze their data. And then in a few slides, I'll get to maybe the broader point, which is sort of how computer vision, egocentric computer vision and developmental psychology might actually help each other. But anyway, um, you know, initially we were thinking just in terms of kind of a superficial collaboration where they had problems and we wanted to develop computer vision algorithms to solve them. So for example, you know, they were say uh, paying undergraduate students to annotate the bounding boxes of the objects in every frame for all of this data. Well, you know, using modern computer vision, we can automate that process. Or um, they were interested in uh, when parents and children are holding objects because those are key moments uh, for learning. Held objects are, are very important. Manual, manual interaction with objects is important. And so we wanted to code the location and pose of hands. And so that led to our paper from, oh, well, now a while ago, ICCB 2015, where we were interested in detecting and segmenting hands exactly for this purpose. Um, and then more recently, we've been interested in joint um, detection and joint pose detection of both hands and held objects, because of course the hands are not operating in isolation, they're, being, they're, they're holding objects. And so we have a paper from last year that looks at that, again, directly inspired from sort of like how we could help the developmental psychologists code their data. Um, here, let, let me sort of mention one more kind of interesting line of work. Um, you know, we often think of egocentric computer vision as uh, egocentric uh, video as looking like this. This is from a, a head mounted camera on a parent in this case. But of course, this is not really what the parent was perceiving. The parent was perceiving something much closer to this because humans have foveated vision, which means that we only see in sort of high resolution right around the gaze point, around two degrees um, of, the of the gaze point. And so, you know, understanding the role of gaze is also very important. People, as they're exploring environment or children, as they're interacting with one, um, they are sort of modulating both their head position, which sort of controls the field of view, but also the gaze point within, the, within, that, um, within that field of view. And so um, we've looked at the problem of modeling gaze and estimating gaze and predicting gaze in the future. And so this is work of my student Zewa Zhang, who had a paper at Neurops, I guess, last year, where his goal was given egocentric gaze, e egocentric video data from a child or parent, uh, that was sort of a short clip of a few seconds, try to annotate every frame with where they were likely to be looking, given no information at test time. So at training time and for evaluation, of course, we had results, we had um, gaze tracking results, but for uh, at test time, we didn't have that. So you're trying to estimate this automatically. And what we found, and, and then you can do this for parents and you can do it for children and you can compare the two and it sort of tells you something about the way that people are choosing what to gaze at. And it's 
to a large extent what you might expect. The highly salient regions get gazed at, get attended to, um, faces get attended to, objects that are moving, um, objects that are held, their near hands sort of are preferred both by the, the model and the person. And then sort of building on this, we looked at the problem of maybe not identifying precisely the gaze point, the XY coordinate, because people don't really think in terms of XY coordinates, they think in terms of objects that are being attended to. So we looked at whether we could estimate which object in the field of view is being attended to. And uh, this is a project by Shujan Naha and, and, uh, and uh, Reza, who's my uh, postdoc. And they looked at whether given only weak supervision, that is only given these egocentric frames and a, um, a label indicating which object the person was looking at. Could the system automatically learn a model that could then in new images like this one, not only identify where the person was looking within the field of view, which object they were likely to be attended to, but also the identity of that object. And so that, that appeared at uh, BMBC last year. So what I've talked about so far is kind of like this Oh, I'll call it sort of a shallow or maybe superficial collaboration where like, you know, there was data that the developmental psychologists collected and then they needed help analyzing and processing it. And we were like, oh, these are cool technical challenges. And so we'll, we'll work on it, develop some new solution and then, you know, publish it largely in the computer vision conference. Um, but maybe what I wanted to talk about more and what Satoshi's already alluded to a little while ago is that I think there's this really interesting feedback loop here where um, sure we can use egocentric vision to study child development, but maybe that can also be used to improve computer vision. And so if I were to have a second chance at this talk and rewind uh, 13 minutes, maybe I would instead propose the title egocentric vision to study child development to improve computer vision. And, and if I were to give this talk, then I think I might start it in a completely different way. Um, so I would say something like, you know, it is, it is springtime for computer vision. Like it just seems like there's so many opportunities for computer vision, it's working so well. There's so many great headlines. There's whatever, more than a thousand papers presented this week on the latest, um, the latest breakthroughs. And yet there also seems to be a lot of problems, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that are just not working as well as we might hope. Um, and we see the headlines for these as well. Algorithms that don't work well out of context, algorithms that have bias, uh, the, the, how difficult it is to do few shot learning and things like that. And so maybe we, you know, in general, it just seems like we have so much to learn. And, and maybe in order to get that next level, maybe we're sort of asymptoting in performance, maybe we're not, but maybe we are. And maybe we need to think sort of outside the box. And perhaps we should be studying like the most formidable, powerful visual learning machine that there is in the known universe, as far as we know, in the history of the universe. And that machine is, um, well, my three-year-old nephew, but really any child, because children are just amazingly good <laughs> at this task that we are trying to replicate in, in computers. And so wouldn't it make a lot of sense for us to understand better and work with developmental psychologists to understand better maybe what kids are doing or, or, or kind of the constraints that they face and the way they overcome them in order to improve computer vision. And so for example, children are amazingly efficient one-shot learners. So you know our psychology colleagues tell us that at their peak, a child, young child can learn dozens of new words per day. And they can do this in a way that is what we might call one shot, where given maybe one toy fire truck that they play with for a while and they see from lots of different perspectives as they manipulate it and so on. Um, but given that single instance of a fire truck, they are then able to go out throughout, throughout the rest of their whole lives and recognize every fire truck they'll ever see even if it's a drawing, even if it's a plush toy, even if it's a different color, even if it's completely in the wrong context, they're able to do this in, in a way that, that, that computers, at least right now, cannot. Um, so how do they do this? Well, um, it's probably not using convolutional neural networks. It's probably not using transformers. Uh, it, you know, might have some similar flavors in there, but among other things, you know, the computer runs on ones and zeros and electricity and kids' brains run on 
you know, powered by whatever applesauce or whatever. It's a completely different mechanism. So there's kind of the, you know, the how the mechanism works part. And, and that has answers in, you know, developmental psychology and cognitive science and neuroscience. And, and there's many people working on this. Um, what we've been thinking about instead is looking not at sort of the mechanism and how the mechanism might be different, but instead just thinking about how sort of the whole paradigm might be different, how the training data might be different, for example. Because, um, you know, a key difference between these two systems, like the modern computational visual learning system and the visual learning system of a child, is that this training data is very different. Um, if, you know, you or I as a computer vision researcher wanted to, to train a model for a car to recognize cars, we would probably go out to the internet and download a million images of cars and uh, we get something that looks like this. And of course, um, that's not what kids do. Instead, um, kids like play with toys or play with other objects in everyday interactions um, as they manipulate the toys. So they're seeing the same, you know, same in this case, little car from lots of different perspectives, but it's a single instance. And they, see, they get sort of massive amounts of experience with that single instance of the object. They see it in varying illumination conditions. They see it from varying, obj uh, from varying viewpoints. They see it from varying states of occlusion and so on. And, and maybe being able to interact with the objects, maybe seeing all of these different um, sort of points of view of the same object is really important for building up like understanding of what 3D objects look like when they're projected from different angles or how illumination and variance works and, and stuff like that. Um, so our major goal in all of this work is really to try to kind of understand what are sort of the constraints and unique properties that kids are getting as they go about these learning tasks using the data collected from the egocentric um, cameras and uh, engage trackers in order to do this. And so I'm gonna talk here briefly about sort of three studies um, that have looked at this in, in, in our lab. And um, Satoshi talked about one briefly, and I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit more detail. And then I'll, I'll talk about two others as well. And, and I'll warn you ahead of time that there's no, there's no like earth shattering breakthrough here. So it's not like at the end, I'm going to present, you know, 100% accuracy on image net results or anything like that. The point more is to just sort of think about like how this, there should be, there could be sort of mutual reinforcing, mutual benefit between looking at egocentric uh, computer vision, computer vision as, and, and developmental psychology. So let me tell you about this first um, study that was done um, by Sven Bombach, who was a postdoc on, at my lab, and now he works at um, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Satoshi, who you heard from a little bit ago. And our goal here was to collect a large amount, relatively large amount of this data of kids and parents interacting in everyday learning environments, and to try to quantify the sort of distributional properties of the training data that they're collecting, the data that they're collecting, which their visual system is using for training. And then we wanted to investigate how these properties affect the accuracy of a computational visual learning model when it's used as training data for that model. And then as Satoshi mentioned, to test whether these properties in other computer vision data sets could lead to better training of object models. So this is the idea of sort of closing the loop. And this work appeared at COGSI and NeurIPS, and we have another uh, preprint that's coming out about this as well. So uh, to give a little bit more detail, as I mentioned, we uh, Chen and Linda use these lightweight head-mounted cameras and eye gaze trackers that sort of record a good approximation of people's field of view as they go about everyday activities. Um, for all the experiments that I'll report here, we had 26 pairs of children and parents participate. And the children range in age from about 15 to 24 months. And they came into a lab environment that was set up to look like a home and on sort of the, so there's like a carpet and some chairs and stuff. And um, on the carpet, there were 24 toy objects that we provided that were just kind of randomly distributed. And the parents were just told to like play with the child with these objects. So we didn't give them any more detail. We didn't give them more instructions than that. Um, like I said before, the cameras were synchronized so that at any moment in time, we can see the view from the parent and the view and their gaze position and the view from the, the child and their gaze position. Um, and so we, since we're interested in visual object learning, we started by, in each of the frames collected by these 
these um, adults and kids, we annotated the positions and bounding boxes of each of these 24 objects um, in the frame of both the ch parent and child videos. Uh, we used like a semi-automatic semi approach. So we, we ran a, at the time YOLO detector and then uh, had people, had human annotators go through to, to fix the mistakes. Um, there's about 100 minutes of data, about 200 minutes of data total, 100 minutes per subject. And uh, I think there was about 500,000 frames or something like that that we annotated. And so the first experiment we tried was just, let's think of like the parent, the data collected from all the parents as one training data set, one data set that could be used for training a CNN. Mm -hmm. And then let's take this other data set collected from the kids, again, in the same environment, exactly the same environment, they're looking at the same stuff, just from two different perspectives, and use that to train a separate CNN. And, and see what happens. And then, and so that's what we did. And then we tested on an uh, independent data set that was of controlled views of these same objects taken on a turntable. So it was not e egocentric data, it was third person data. And so again, we tried training a CNN with the parent data, then with the child data, and comparing the accuracy of those two separate models on a test data set. And we found, intriguingly, that the child data worked significantly better for training than the parent data set. And, um, and it turned out that like no matter how we slice the data, that, that effect was still there. I'll show you some more results later. So it, you know, we, we ruled out that it was just some statistical anomaly or something like that. And so then we started thinking, well, what explains this? Like, why would it be that somehow the, the child data is better for training a model? I mean, it makes intuitive sense because they're the ones trying to learn in the environment. But what is it about this data that makes it sort of more amenable to as a, as a training data set? Um, well, here's a little visualization where I show one object, the toy helmet, uh, toy football helmet. And um, on the left are some random cropped boxes from the child data, and on the right are from the uh, adult data. And so, so one thing that's obvious is that the toddler's views of objects tend to be larger, as Satoshi alluded to earlier. And, and so you, we can, of course, quantify this. So if you look at sort of a histogram of object size, this is object size as a proportion of the field of view of the camera, um, you can see that um, parents tend to get much smaller object views than child, children. In particular, like the average size, the mean of this distribution is about 13% of the field of view. So the average object takes up about 13% of the field of view for the children, which is about this size there, um, compared to about only 5% for the, for the parent. Now, this is could be explained by simple things, right? It could be because kids' arms are shorter, so they see larger views of things that they're holding. Um, it could be because they're closer to the ground. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so maybe, you know, there's no, nothing maybe earth shattering about the fact that this is happening. And yet it could be that this is actually really quite important for learning. Like it could be, you know, the embodied nature of learning means that kids have shorter arms. And so they get larger views of objects, which might be important for helping them solve the referential and, uh, uncertainty problem and get higher tra quality training data for, for, for learning. Um, but besides size, if you look at these distributions, you'll also notice that the views are also different in terms of sort of the diversity of the views that you get. And um, Satoshi showed this figure earlier. This is a figure that he prepared um, for this paper. And uh, basically what he did here is he took um, views, in this case of one particular object, the, the blue car, and he took sort of the cropped bounding boxes from the toddler view and took them from the parent's view and then just ran simple multidimensional scaling to, to project them into a 2D space. And uh, what's sort of immediately obvious is that um, in both views, there's sort of this core, um, there's sort of this core cluster of views that are very similar to one another. And, uh, and then, but in the toddler view, there's a lot more outliers. There's a lot greater diversity of the views. And we can quantify this in various ways. So here's a quant a one way of doing it, which is to um, look at all pairs of uh, cropped boxes for the two data sets and compute the distance between them in terms of, I think we used a simple gist distance here. And uh, we found that the toddlers 
uh, again, sort of quantitatively, you find that the parents and the toddlers both have sort of this um, central core of highly similar instances, but the toddlers have a much longer field of view, or, sorry, much uh, larger tail in this distribution. And so it appears that um, toddlers are sort of collecting some combination of the, of the outliers and the, the core sort of central cluster of object views. And so one way of interpreting this is that toddlers spend hours every day um, just playing with toys, actively manipulating them. And as they manipulate them, they create training data by like self-selecting object views. You know, maybe they're less, they're less, uh, they're less skillful when they're manipulating an object. So they, they see it from lots of different perspectives, whereas the parents only sort of are, are much more adept at that. And so they handle it largely from, see largely planar views of an object. But whatever the reason, this creates more diverse views for children than for the parents. And so as Satoshi talked about very briefly, and I'll just talk about in a little bit more detail here, um, there's from the perspective of a learning system, you can think of there being like a trade-off here because on one hand, a learning system probably wants to have many sort of high quality, highly similar um, examples that are sort of the common views of something in like ideal lighting conditions and from canonical views, because that might be really important for like building the core prototypes of what an object, what, what it is to be a football helmet, for example. Um, but that might limit the system's ability to generalize and recognize new instances in the future. So in contrast, maybe having a lot of diversity would be good, but then having too many outliers might make it difficult to sort for the model to sort of learn the important core patterns. And so it seems that like the toddlers are somehow collecting a mixture of these two in a proportion that kind of strikes a good balance between these, these two forces that are intentioned. And so to test this, we, um, we constructed, we tried to construct basically synthetic training data sets or, or data sets made up of, um, uh, of different, of uh, syn synthetic proportions of, of the original data sets to sort of explicitly control how many similar examples and how many diverse examples we were getting. And then we could train models to see how well those training data sets formed by, from different mixtures actually worked um, on, on, the, on, our, uh, on the, the recognition experiments. And so um, we, in, in the original set of training data from the kids, we uh, collected similar examples. So these are examples with sort of a minimum total pairwise distance. And then we, we collected a set, a subset of diverse examples. These are ones with sort of maximum total um, pairwise distance. And then we can, um, train models with different combinations of these two in proportion. So this graph here is showing you on the x-axis the number of images per class in our experiments. Again, there were uh, 24 object categories. And the test accuracy, again, tested on that independent lab uh, taken uh, uh, image data set of, of the same objects, but in a controlled setting, systematically taken. And so to sort of, sort of just limit your attention at one thing, look at the case where there's 200 images per class. Um, so if we, if we simply take only diverse images, so these are basically outliers, you get a performance that's here, an accuracy that's here. Um, if you limit to so sort of the blue bar there on the left, if you um, look, use only the highly similar examples, then you get something that's a little bit better, but kind of similar in performance. That's the yellow bar on the, on the right. But in the middle, by using about 50% uh, diverse and 50% similar, we get a an accuracy that's at or maybe even slightly above the original uh, data that was the original distribution that was collected by the kids themselves. Um, so these results are kind of consistent with our hypothesis that children have sort of naturally collected a, a distribution of similar and diverse training examples that you know maybe is like ideal for efficient for efficient learning of robust object models. And then, um, as Satoshi mentioned, we also looked at whether this childlike distribution could also benefit more traditional data sets, more traditional problems in computer vision. And this is very preliminary work, but I think it's, it's super interesting. 
Um, you can think of like child learning as an example of what we might call domain generalization in computer vision. So, you know, the kids are learning their classifiers on one data set that's like, you know, of toys in their room, and then they're evaluating by going off into the real world and trying to recognize, you know, fire trucks as they drive by. And um, maybe, so computer vision researchers, at least me, I typically just train on whatever all available data that I have. And I just sort of think, well, more training data is better, but perhaps there's like important structure in that data. And maybe by having like a childlike distribution of data, we could improve generalization. So Satoshi did these experiments where he um, collected a data set of 12 different object classes um, and used training data from COCO and test data from ShapeNet. So again, sort of testing this uh, generalization, domain generalization thing. And uh, I have another one of these plots here. I'll again, focus your attention maybe on the 200 images per class case. So here we find that, um, okay, diverse, the diverse subset works. Um, well, diverse subset is that blue bar on the, the left and, and it works okay. And then the, the, the similar subset, the one that consists of mostly highly similar examples is there on the right. And, and that works a little bit worse. But the best, at least by a little bit, seems to be this combination of 50% diverse, 50% similar, just like what was happening with the child data. And notice that that sort of synthetic combination of, uh, of training examples works significantly better than the case where we just randomly, um, where we randomly sample uh, the same number of images from the, from the COCO data set. And so it's at least, you know, these are preliminary results, but they at least suggest that that training data collected by kids as they naturally uh, interact with objects has some sort of special distribution that's highly efficient for learning. And maybe, just maybe, who knows, but maybe computer vision researchers may be able to improve their algorithms or improve their, their training paradigms by, by using this insight from kids. Um, by the way, if you look in our paper, we do a, a lot of additional analysis. So for example, um, as I mentioned, there are uh, you know, kids and adults, we all see with foveated vision, which means that at any moment in time, we're really, even though we have the illusion of having a high, uh, large field of view, we're really only getting a very small uh, part of our visual field in high resolution. And that probably could be very important for, for visual learning by kids because it helps focus their attention and, and block out lots of distractors. And so we've done various experiments, which you can look at in our paper, um, that sort of looks at this trade-off of a learning system in terms of like how large the foveation is and how large the field of view is. Because again, there's sort of forces and tension here. If you have um, a really focused fovea, that might be really good because it, it sort of focuses your attention on the thing you're trying supposed to be learning from. On the other hand, if you have a large field of, uh, but on the other hand, it might be difficult to learn sort of a overall model of an object if you can only see parts of it at a time. On the other hand, having a large field of view has the opposite set of strengths and weaknesses. Um, also in our, our papers, we, we've done some other experiments where we sort of slice and dice data in different ways, uh, experiments in different ways. So, so one thing is that you can imagine that every one of our children is like a different training data set. So every one of our kids might be interacting with objects in a different way. And some kids might, for whatever reason, have a strategy that works better for learning visual, um, visual properties than others. And so we've done experiments where we use, you know, everybody's all the different kids uh, training data sets and we, and we compare their, their um, accuracy when tested on a common data set. And it turns out that you know, that is the case, at least some, some kids for whatever reason in our experiments collected better data than others. So to sort of conclude this first study, um, our results suggest that the data collected by kids as they naturally interact with objects has special structure that is efficient for learning and the computer vision may benefit from that insight. So now I'd like to talk about two more studies a little bit more briefly um, that are also in line with this overall goal, but have a little bit different focus, foci. Um, so let me go back to that problem of referential uncertainty. Remember, that's the one where the child learner hears this word, pegbo, and they're trying to figure out like how to associate that with what they're seeing in the world, which of the parts of this scene is supposed to be associated with that word. Um, in the experiments we did in study one, we used basically ground truth labels. So we, you know, manually had segmented out, cropped out objects or um, depending on the variation of experiments or, but, but we definitely had 
the ground truth um, label for that object. And that, of course, is not what kids get because kids are hearing uh, what their parents are saying, but they're kind of looking all over the place. And so often they might be looking at something, hearing a, a label that is perhaps related to that object that they're attending to, or it might be completely unrelated. The, the, the label may be ambiguous, it may be misleading. So in this like study number two, which was uh, published by uh, back at, in CogSci 2020 and involves um, these folks here, we asked the question, can a model successfully acquire the associations between spoken words and visual objects using only information available to a child? So the only information they have is the egocentric video, the gaze, and the parent utterance. And so the setup looks something like this. Um, you know, parents are talking to their kids and the parent might say, one little ladybug. Okay, so we transcribed all of the parent, all the parent speech. We found instances where they named uh, one of the objects. And then around that utterance, we, we uh, collected several seconds of frames in either direction. We also had the gaze data. We have the infant view and the parent view for each of these. Sometimes they're looking at the right thing, like ladybug here or snowman. Sometimes they're looking at the wrong thing, like helmet. And so this would be an example of um, misleading, you know, misleading data. And I will skip all the modeling and stuff. You can look in the paper for details there and just sort of skip to the, to the punchline. Um, it turns out that when we train on the actual parent utterances, labeling egocentric child frames, which may or may not be right, um, and test on those clean photos like before, we find that our computational model is able to learn um, is able to learn models is able to learn models for these objects even given this weak supervision. However, on the parent data, we don't see a market improvement. So the parent data sort of asymptotes at a relatively low accuracy. Um, why is this? Well, it's probably likely that the the parent is maybe looking at the child instead of looking at the object they're naming. There might also be uh, it might also be because of the the differences in the child and parent data that we identified before. Um, so our conclusion here for study number two is, so can a model successfully acquire the associations between spoken words and visual objects? Well, so the answer seems to be yes. The raw sensory data perceived by infant learners contain enough statistical information for word learning by a simple ideal learning model. And in um, cognitive science, people have, in psychology, people have um, explored this idea, and th there's these theories called cross-referential uh, cross referential learning, which means that, um, that a child maybe cannot pick up, cannot learn the name of an object from a single example, but instead, that if they see that, um, if, if they hear that word in multiple different contexts, um, where there's sort of a different statistical distribution, different objects are in view, by sort of integrating information across those different contexts, they're able to successfully learn uh, the name of an object, the name of an object, which may be what's going on here as well. So finally, let me talk about um, study number three. So again, study number one was comparing uh, the performance of computational models trained on data from uh, kids and adults. And study number two was sort of simulating a child trying to learn based on noisy parent utterances and the egocentric field of view and the gaze, gaze data. In the third study, we're not really interested in the in the accuracy of the model. We're actually interested in the accuracy of the child. So for example, um, let's say we have two children, subject A, child A, and child B. And child A saw these frames, and their parents said koala there, there, and there. And subject B had this sequence of frames, and they saw, and they heard koala here, here. Now, at the end of each of these experiments, we can give the kids we can, we can use objects that are novel to them, so they didn't know the name of ahead of time. And then after, we can test their ability to be able to recognize that object. So we can test whether the kid actually learned the name of the kid's you know, visual system actually learned the name of the object. Um, and in this case, for example, subject A, using their training data, apparently was able to learn the name of koala, and subject B was not. So our question here is, could we actually train like just a simple CNN model to distinguish between the training data 
that allowed a subject to learn the name of the word versus the training data that did not. So just given the frames here, can we distinguish people like subject A from people like subject B? And this is a really difficult problem. Um, here is sort of an example. Here, is, here are frames from eight different uh, children at the moment when the parent said moose, okay? And here's four different kids on the left. This is set A. Here's four different kids on the set on the left on the right set B. And again, both of the all of these are taken from the moment when the parents said moose. So the question is, well, which group of kids successfully learned moose, uh, A or B? Now. I don't remember the answer, <laughs> but the, the point is that it's very difficult to distinguish like what maybe is the key factor here. It, you know, it might be things about which objects are being held, but there's no key, key pattern that one or the other involves held objects. There's no key pattern about one or the other is larger or whatever. Um, but it turns out that actually, for whatever reason, there is some there is some um, some visual regularities here because these simple CNN models were able to actually predict. Um, with accuracy greater than chance, uh, which are the sort of training data that led to successful outcome by the child and which ones and which ones were not. And so for more details on that, I forgot to mention this is uh, work by um, Andre Amatuni and, and, and others. Um, for more details on that, you can check out our COGSI 2021 paper, which will be, I think it's on my website, but it's coming out. It'll be, it'll be presented next month. So to answer the question of study number three, can a computational model predict if a child will learn a word given the raw egocentric video that they observed? The answer seems to be, well, yes, at least preliminarily. The raw sensory data contains distinctive visual properties that can differentiate frames associated with successful versus unsuccessful learning. And what we need to do now is understand what are those properties. Now we've just proven there's a proof of principle that those properties are there because they were learned by the CNN, but we need to figure out what they are. So as I wrap up here, um, I'll just mention that this idea of using, of sort of looking at joint uh, investigations of computer vision, egocentric computer vision, and developmental psychology is something that is gaining traction, I think, both on sort of the computer vision side and also on the developmental psychology side. And um, so that I don't like just recommend only papers by my group, I thought that I'd recommend this very interesting paper if you're interested in, in looking at this in more detail. It's called Self-Supervised Learning Through the Eyes of a Child, and it's by um, folks at NYU, Brendan Lake's lab. And uh, it was at NeurIPS, I think, last year. And what they did is take um, child head cam data and they, and they trained a self-supervised model and they showed that uh, you know, pre-training on that data set actually worked better than other, some of the other data sets they, that they tested, suggesting anyway that there's kind of interesting, unique properties of the kinds of data that kids collect as they're just freely playing in the world as they're just going through their everyday lives in the world that might be especially uh, amenable to, to self-supervised learning. So with that, because I'm out of time, <laughs> I'll say thank you so much um, for listening. And again, um, here are just some of the many folks that are involved in these projects. And if you're interested in more detail, um, feel free to please check out my uh, webpage or Chen Yu's webpage, and, uh, and you can find lots more detail there. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, are there questions from the audience or the panelists? Uh, I, I, I have a question. Um, yeah, please. Funny. I, I was wondering at which stage do children do children get to learn objects first and then actions? Do they, do parents teach words of what the objects are first? Uh, I have no clue. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we've actually been looking at actions more recently. Actions are harder and they develop later. The, the object names occur first. And, and you can imagine, well, you could probably argue it either way, but you can imagine why that is. Sort of a verb or action is sort of much more abstract. It gets much more complicated. There's sort of very fine differentiations between things like, you know, we've been looking at differences between like turn and twist. Like what's the difference between turn and twist? Yeah. There, there is a difference, but I can't explain it, right? And somehow kids, kids are kids able to- know to these that. actions because they're performing them, but learn the words later. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And do, do you think that they use also diversity of 
among the, the objects, for instance, with respect to the object of, of interest to learn, because the study was uh, uh, focused on one specific ob object diversity within uh, that class. But do you think that uh, they, they observe with respect to the objects uh, they have in their hands? Is this something that a child used to learn an object? Yeah, so I guess we don't know a lot. I, I think we're, we need to be careful about speculating about sort of right. what is the mechanism by which kids are doing this, because we're not trying to simulate that. In fact, a lot of times people ask, like, well, don't you have to assume here that, like, kids are using, you know, AlexNet or whatever for any of this to be valid? It, it's more like we're trying to just understand the kinds of structure that are in the training data by using, like, you know, deep learning as sort of like a data mining tool so that if there if something can be learned by that ideal learner model then we know that there's structure there that could also be learned by a child but we don't know you know what the mechanism is and um, so we have looked like across all of the objects we find very consistently these these this greater diversity the, those distributions are there but yeah in terms of like how exactly they're being used i think we don't know that yet 